Hi, I'm Melvin, the CEO of Dr. Wealth, and we have today... Okay, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm the trainer for the Early Retirement Masterclass. <laughs> okay, we were given this topic, okay. and we're supposed to spar on it, okay. which is Singapore versus overseas investing. Okay. And I know that you are a staunch believer of Singapore stocks. Okay? Yep. yep. And that's why I want to kick off. The question to you is that, you know, a lot of people have okay. been complaining about Singapore returns, which right. has been lower relative to US stocks. Okay. And we also saw that more people were flog, uh, flagging into the US uh, markets and investing in those uh, areas, right? Okay. And, but you're sticking with Singapore stocks. Yep, I'm sticking with Singapore stocks. Okay, so can so, you at least share with us what's your reason behind it? Okay, so, so for a start, more than 95% of the stocks I have in my personal portfolio uh, are domiciled in Singapore. All right. Uh, and there are basically two primary reasons why I think Singapore stocks uh, are better bet for a person of my age, all right? Not for everyone, but for a person my age. The first is that you must look at the treatment of dividends. So when a real estate investment trust declares a dividend, the rental yields that they collect from their tenants is not taxed at the corporate level, right? So uh, even for an ordinary company like SPH, there's a 17% corporate tax. So for REITs, there is no tax. And then when it flows to your personal funds, it is also not taxed at the personal level. So this basically gives people like me, uh, Gen X people, uh, some kind of advantage because we don't have to pay so much taxes and we get wonderful dividends along the way, right? So we get paid for being patient with the stock market. So that's good. The second reason is, uh, obviously, as you get older in life, there is a greater chance of mortality risk and there is a risk that you might actually pass away. Now, if I have my funds with the US stock market, not only am I paying a 30% withholding dividends tax, there will be estate planning issues if I were to suddenly pass away. So if my wife has to extract the Tesla stocks under my name in the US, there is a possibility that she has to uh, end up dealing with inheritance taxes that would complicate estate matters. So uh, these are the things that older investors might have to grapple with and obviously uh, younger investors don't care. Right, they have most of their money in Palantir, in Tesla, and, and I'm totally fine with that. Right, I, I, my wh whatever minority I have in the U.S. stocks, they're mainly concentrated in Palantir. So yeah, so I'm I'm also invested in these counters. Okay, yeah, and, and you mentioned about the yeah. estate tax, right? Can can you give a little bit more information about you know what should investors look out for? Okay, I'm not an expert in inheritance taxation. Okay, so I do not know uh, what happens and how many percent they will levy from the U.S. Uh, but uh, what I hear from uh, the people who are more savvy than me is that uh, before they pass away, they leave their password and their account with their children. So if anything were to happen to them, they'll find a way to sort somehow sell the stocks, extract the stocks by somebody else doing it lah, because you're already gone, right? And then they, are, they can somehow evade these taxes. Lah. But I think it's very, very dangerous to do that. And... Uh, so, many so, families so, so can it's, not even, it's not even politically yeah. correct to talk yeah. about this in this video, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think the best thing is to get legal advice. The best thing is to get legal advice. And when you hit a particular age, like if you're 75 years old, maybe you shouldn't invest in the US. But you if find a way say, to move the money back. But if let's right? say the invested yeah. amount is very low, right? right. Would, would the government like really go and prosecute every single person, every single foreign okay. investor? I don't think so, right? Probably after a certain net worth, then it's worthwhile to do so. Yeah, I I heard, I heard, uh, and, and I need someone else to confirm that it gets dangerous after about 50 to 60,000. So so beyond that amount, right? Okay. And there might be some enforcement. Because yeah, that was what I remember yeah. was like the 60,000 was the first cut off, right? The Something first 60, like that. Not, not, not taxable, but yeah. after that, uh, it could be as high as 40%. Of the yeah. asset could be taxed. Yeah, you're you're paying forty percent to Biden to basically take the money and distribute it to uh, all the U.S. citizens. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. I I think that's that that I think to me it's not really worthwhile. Yeah. Okay. So okay. so so, and I, so these are my reasons. Okay. So which means it's yeah. also a few consideration. One is that you are more of a dividend investor, yep. which has dividend taxation in that's the correct. U.S. Right. And then the second thing is that because you are of a more senior age I wouldn't say older but senior age Gen X is fairly old now <laughs> yeah we, we're all vaccinated un unlike the geriatric millennials and, and the young adults so hey, that's me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> young adults right. so, so which yeah. means that um, on, on the second note which you yeah. 
brought about was that um, because you are more senior, you never know, right? What could happen to you, and if that yeah. happens, that estate tax could be liable That's for right. your beneficiaries, and yeah. it's not worth paying. Yeah, but like I said, I might be wrong. Consult a tax advisor, all right? I'm not an expert. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that that is what has been uh, yeah. like keeping you in Singapore. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, would I say that if someone who is a millennial and he's interested, or he or she is interested in growth stocks? Okay. Would, would he or she better off in investing in US compared to Singapore? Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert in growth stocks. I dabble in one or two stocks and they've done relatively well. Uh, but for me, my fear about growth investing, especially in the US, when it comes to the Teslas, uh, the FANG stocks, is that if you look at the cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, which is a PE ratio, uh, but it's uh, adjusted, so it's the average P/E ratio uh, with ten years of historical data, right? The valuation of U.S. stocks is very high. I was preparing my lecture notes today, and we are looking at a P/E of about thirty-five to thirty-six. You know, it's at, at that kind of range. But if you're looking at the Singapore stock market, it is only about uh, sixteen um, on March thirty-first. So, if you're investing in your growth stocks, the fear is that it's no longer so much as in the stock doesn't grow based on your projection. The fear is that sometimes even when the stock were to grow based on your expectations, with that kind of high PE, there is a market correction and you still end up losing money. And, and it's something that I think everybody is already experiencing. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on hindsight, right? Now, for me, if anything were to happen to my REITs and there is a crash, the dividend use generally would go up. So I know that if I were to tell my students, go in, this is a good time, I know that I'm not leading them astray because they'll at least be getting higher dividends. And there is a certain mean reverting kind of capability for these uh, local Singapore stocks. Whereas if something like Tesla were to crash, then the problem is... And I think that's something which even the best growth investors cannot answer is that how long will it crash for? When will it bottom out, right? So I, we have a lot of these um, in various finance forums. We've got uh, what we call these growth investing bros and, and now they are crypto bros, right? They're basically very rude, thuggish kind of uh, people that like to go in and brag about their, their trades. Like they go in at the bottom level and then they get out at a high level. And you know how bad the situation is because they've all disappeared. Save one or two extremely notorious guys, uh, you, you don't find them anymore, right? So, yeah, so, so I think that's, that's the fundamental problem right now. You don't have to take my word for it, you just have to observe the various forums. And uh, So what, yeah. what I'm hearing from yeah. you is that um, you have to play the long game. You have to play yeah. a sustainable game. That's and right. you're saying that a lot of all these growth stocks or even cryptocurrencies, they are a lot more hyped up in the process and people just get trapped in that yep. and pay a very high price for owning all these assets. Yeah, that's right. And I think in that sense, Charlie Munger might not be wrong. You shouldn't be asking yourself uh, what kind of stocks you want to buy that would really dramatically increase in value. Charlie Munger preferred to ask yourself the question, uh, what do I avoid, <laughs> right? And so he talks about inversion, right? Now, if you look at the people my age, you know, and you observe the blogosphere and you uh, observe the various forums, right? Why are there so few boomer or Gen X bloggers out there? Because many of us have somehow disappeared, right? Maybe we've been killed investing in growth stocks and we were killed off in the year 2002 when there was a dot-com crash. And that's why you just see just a bunch of us, you know, walking around you know, claiming to be financially free, right? Yeah, so younger people need to ask themselves these questions because the kind of crypto and growth investing bros you see in the forum, they're all going to gradually disappear, leaving maybe one or two elites or extremely lucky guys. And then they might, you know, 20 years down the road in their 40s, be dispensing financial wisdom to other people, right? So I think that's something okay. everybody can think so about. So another point I picked up is yeah. that, you know, you talk about yeah. philosophies, you talk right. about mental models, you talk about Charlie Munger doing the yeah. inversion. Right. And... Um, what you are just explaining just now mm. was about Lindy effect, right? You are saying that mm. you know since two thousand two the dot com crisis and look at whoever survived are the survival of Lindy. Okay, okay, right, and that is where you should take your guidance from rather than uh, the very rare minority of growth investor who have survived those kind of 
Um, yeah. Periods which could just be luck, right? Yeah, and and the scary thing is that if you read growth investing literature, or maybe I'm ignorant about growth investing literature, but the only guy I know that's been survived until now uh, was Peter Lynch. All right, and, and uh, Peter Lynch didn't stay long in the industry. He basically accumulated a track record that was better than Warren Buffett, and then he ran. Yeah, and, and he's still around today. So maybe you can learn a little bit from someone like him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, for for me, right, yeah. I do uh, a lot of investment in China. All right. Okay. What do you have to say about that? What concerns would you have for someone who invests in China? Now, I I really actually believe that if you invest in China, you can really become very wealthy one day. Okay. Um, for me, the reason why I'm not in China is largely because uh, I couldn't pass my Mandarin when I was doing my AO levels. I, I, I probably one of those rare Singaporeans who failed the exam four times. The fourth time I failed it was uh, during national service. So there is a serious linguistic disadvantage. I, I, I probably won't be able to understand uh, their financial statements, right? And um, of course, I, I understand this weakness of mine. I, I, I work very hard to overcompensate by reading a lot about One Belt, One Road. Uh, I read about Chinese politics and history and it actually scares me even more because uh, One Belt, One Road, uh, the, the way the West looks at China is extremely negative and I can't even find a counterfactual that is that actually paints them in a very positive light, right? So, uh, so, so, so that's the reason why uh, I do not touch China and I believe that a socialist state, right, uh, for, for it to function normally the Chinese cannot allow an entrepreneurial class right uh, to take over and then dictate how society is going to be run. The, the reason is because I think in Chinese culture uh, we, we actually put uh, our mandarins first I think followed by our farmers and I think our merchants come all the way at the end last after the craftsman the, the Confucianism kind of, kind of yeah and I think that, that that still runs the Chinese kind of zeitgeist uh, and the leadership uh, is very very careful of that and 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 the other thing is that the chinese communist party knows that the music is going to stop once your your population is not going to grow anymore uh, you have an aging population then then people <laughs> will um not be so compliant with you right uh, i i won't take 996 lying down i i i will just lie down and just let society roll over me right so so as you read these articles then the more fearful uh, I become. So uh, I, I, I don't totally buy the idea that the Chinese would actually win when it comes to AI and, and quantum computing. So because of that, yeah, I, I have some personal fears, but, but I, 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 I still believe that whoever understands China very well can, can make a lot of money. And, and I, I still believe that uh, I, I might be wrong because after all, I think uh, the difference between Han civilization and Caucasian civilization is that Han civilization we work really hard. Yeah, you look at every single society bound by Confucianism, we work longer hours, suicide rates are higher, uh, stronger than the Protestant-based Caucasian kind of societies. Lah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so right now I, 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 I don't have a view. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm studying and I'm carefully trying to pick up more, more skills to see whether there's a chance of going in. And even if I go in, it'll be via the ETF route. I, I probably don't think I'm smart enough to uh, buy an individual Chinese company. It's like, yeah, can't tell the difference between like Mei Tuan la and yeah, they, they all sound the same to Pili Pili. What is Pili Pili? They, they all sound the same to me. So, yeah. yeah. Could, could it be yeah. a case where, you yeah. know, uh, when you have been reading all this information on this shirt, it's always coming from the West. Yes. And the West has always been against the Chinese because if you look throughout history, right, right. the superpower of the world has always been a uh, yeah. Western civilization. It has never right. been some. Uh, kind of culture that's totally opposite to what they have been used to, right? And Confucianism is almost a polar opposite of that kind of liberal thinking. In yeah, the West. that's right. Um, yeah, like I follow the Economist religiously every week, but I think for the past four weeks, I've not read a single positive depiction of China in their in their Taiwan. Uh, uh, but, but but the thing I, I read yeah. the Economist as well. Yeah. Right? But the Economist is known to be a very elegant professional throw. Yeah. <laughs> so they throw the US, they throw yeah. the British, they throw even Singapore. It, right? To be fair, they've never written anything nice about Singapore. Yeah. Even though we are we are number one uh, when dealing with the COVID crisis, uh, they 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 seem to be 
sort of like the crypto frat boys. They're just waiting for us to screw up, then they can jump on us and beat us up. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I guess it's. I guess that's a problem. But, but right? they don't really yeah. have a good word to put for anybody, actually. Well, if they. Really it is. It's pretty critical of anybody. The truth is that America has screwed up so much, and when I read the articles, they were seriously far too kind to the Americans. Really? Yeah, it's, there was a point, I remember the Americans didn't even have clean drinking water because there was lead in their drinking water, and, and still I think the article was kinder than the one on China, which is always about uh, oppression. Yeah, so you can expect this weekend's economist to talk about uh, the three child, uh, policy it should, should be worth reading yeah no, nothing good will come from that so, yeah. Yeah. which which i don't think it works actually right it is not yeah. the limit thing but it's more of an economic policies and other yeah. social policies that has to come in place right yeah, to support yeah. the individuals yeah. to encourage them to have babies yeah uh they the, the good news is that china would just say that singapore did it many years ago <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so we can be blamed yeah <laughs> okay, let's 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 go back to Singapore, right? Okay. So it's an interesting space. We talk about right. US, we talk about China, and we now come back to Singapore. Right. Which always position itself is more like a a blend of a East and a West kind That's of right. situation, yeah. right? So um what do you think Singapore is today and how can we survive better in the future? Considering that you have most of your investment in Singapore, right? So okay. definitely you must be positive about the future. That's uh, I'm actually not as positive. I'm, I'm extremely worried uh, because the OECD now uh, wants to set a floor on corporate taxes. Uh-huh. And the floor, I think right now, they want to set it at 15%. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic because our current corporate tax rate is 17%, but our effective tax rate is well below 15%. Mm-hmm. Right. So the question is, are we going to follow the 15% in word or in spirit? If we follow the 15% in spirit, right, uh, then there may be a flight of capital out of the country. And uh, we, we cannot be naive about this piece of news. This is uh, singularly the biggest existential threat uh, to Singapore investors. But, but to me, yeah. that so I'm is, worried. I'm worried. But to me, that yeah. is very unwesternized of OECD. Yeah. Because it is, yeah. it is to the point that it's more China-like, it's more communist, it's more centrally yeah. governed than anything else. How can they set the floor for other countries they don't even have authority over? Uh, it's very simple. I, I think that the West currently have the ability to influence Asian countries because uh, I think they're still dominant, okay? But I think the population... I think they're lazy. That's why, that's why you need to tax the most productive members of their society uh, to basically give, to basically rob from the haves and give it to the have-nots. But if they keep fleeing to Asia and all that, the, the government cannot enact these very leftist, these socialist policies. See. So uh, right now, I don't see them as having a choice. They will do their best to, uh, they will do their best to, to arm wrestle everybody uh, to, to follow that 15%. Uh, which I think Singapore can handle at 15, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think we would not be able to handle if it goes up to 21. Yeah, uh, but I think, yeah, that, that that is what they will try to do. I, I certainly sincerely hope that uh, at least our government will say, that, okay, since I'm taking more money from the companies here, I'll give more to the companies in return. You know, um, yeah, maybe invest more in education, healthcare infrastructure so that the businesses wouldn't so happily leave the country. Yeah, but this is this is a very worrying thing for me, and and I okay. I so, think that so that's that one yeah, biggest thing yeah, about what is going to happen in Singapore. Yeah, you see when you when you have an investment thesis and you put your your money into a particular country, right? The question shouldn't ask yourself, you know, if it if it does very well, I become financially free. What kind of country am I going to travel to? What beach am I going to? What sunset am I going to? To, to look at what kind of uh, wonderful margarita drinks I'm going to buy. The question I always ask myself is that if I'm going to fail, right, in the next 10 years, what news event now would create that failure, you see? So, okay, so, so it's again that inversion. Yeah, that thing. inversion. And, and, and to me, I think this is, this is really bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I, I, I really want to see, uh, now, now our government has their hands full with COVID-19. They, they, can't, they can't address this threat, uh, but I... Yeah, I want to see something more comprehensive. How do we preserve these investments from the West? Yeah. 
I, I yeah. pretty much agree with you yeah. when it comes to dividend investing. Yeah. Singapore is the best place, right? Mm. Because mm. the yields are generally higher. Mm. There's no dividend taxation. There's not even any capital gain or even mm. estate tax, mm. right? So you really can enjoy a lot of tax, uh, tax incentives That's right. for investing in dividend oh. stocks right. in Singapore, right? And let's say, let's say, okay, yeah, your greatest fear. Uh, of this OECD setting that floor is going right. to happen and Singapore is not going to do as well as mm. currently okay if you're forced to invest in the overseas market oh, where right. would it be? I, I will be in serious trouble when that happens because I, I don't really uh, have a current plan on where to go uh, but I think the other tax-free regime would be Hong Kong so I'll be seriously looking at the counters over there but I'll be doing it very reluctantly because uh, when you're talking about flight of capital out of Singapore, it is theoretical. When you're talking about flight of human capital out of Hong Kong, it is reality. Yeah, it's happening right now. They, they basically, young people are leaving, they're settling down in some third-rate city in England. You know, uh, there'll be hundreds and thousands of flats that will be empty in Hong Kong. But uh, I, I would definitely look at something similar. First, uh, I might look at uh, how about Malaysia the Australian or, or the Commonwealth countries yeah. in general do not have dividend taxation, right? Not it's not just Hong Kong, but how about Malaysia? I won't. I'm not interested in Malaysia. <laughs> there, there is to me half my family is Malaysian, by the way. Uh, uh, and and uh, and whatever suffering the Malaysian Chinese go through, I I've experienced part of it vicariously through my relatives. Uh, there is absolutely nothing redeeming about Malaysia right now and uh, and I, I would rather be looking at Hong Kong and maybe Australia for these markets. Yeah, Australia has some weird dividend franking system yeah, exactly. which I, I need to study. So okay. yeah, and, and I think Telstra pays a fairly fine dividend I think the last time I checked. Yeah, so so I might have to look at these markets. Uh, but I, I think even if that happens, I will not move more than 40% out. I, I will keep 50% in Singapore. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I okay. still feel very strongly in it. Yeah, because I, I, I believe that if our government cannot adjust to something like this, um, yeah, it, it's already one of the, probably the highest paid cabinets in the world, probably one of the best, most effective governments in the world, right? And if you can't handle it, who can, right? Nobody else can, right? Look at how we've handled COVID. We're number one. Yeah, there's only one country with, um, that combines a high vaccination rate with high contact tracing, uh, as well as uh, the ability to do very, very, uh, very, very tough, aggressive enforcement. No, no other country in the world can do that. So yeah. Okay. So what do you expect? Yeah. Okay. But we will argue that Singapore yeah. is a small place and it's a right. lot easier to govern compared to say a larger land mass like India, US or China. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. We, we are lucky in a sense that we are small. In fact, we are lucky because we had British infrastructure and administration and then we had our geographical location, right? Uh, not, not everybody is so lucky to have so many things going for us at once. Lah. Of course, I think the, the narrative is that we don't have natural resources. It's been told to us over and over again. But the truth is that we don't have natural resources, but we have a lot of geographical advantages, right? Yeah, so, so I think that makes up for it. Yeah, uh, yeah we're, we're definitely easier to govern. It's not our fault that we are lucky, right? I mean... Okay. Yeah, it's not. You talk about British infrastructure, right? Yeah. And why not invest in, you know, British stocks? Uh, I I will look at it. I'm 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 happy to look at it. But I I feel that the West and European civilization in general has become very woke recently. And basically, if you just take a browse through Kinokuniya and you look at the books, you're you're not seeing books like um how to become a millionaire, how to uh launch your startup business. I mean, these books are still there. But in the best-selling shelves, you're always looking at books like uh, Capitalism Has Failed Us. What can we do to reform capitalism? All of these books talk okay. about one thing, wealth transfer, right? Yeah, and you're creating this generation of people who are uh, extremely entitled and they somehow believe that the reason they're not successful uh, is because wealthy people have a conspiracy to keep them down. Yeah, I definitely do not want to invest in a country like that. that that's not the way I'm brought up in Singapore. In, in Singapore, uh, I, I think generally speaking, our social mobility, yeah, people claim that it's fading, but I, I think it's still there, right? You're, you're still seeing uh, kids who come from the heartlands 
uh, who go into schools like Raffles Institution, how do I know I do pro bono work with Raffles Institution? And some of these students are on these financial assistance plans, right? So, yeah, so, so I, 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 I wouldn't say that... Uh, I don't agree with the West. I, I don't agree with the West. I don't agree with woke Singaporeans. I definitely don't agree with the crypto frat boys who go around abusing people <laughs> on the financial forums. Yeah, if you don't like it, come throw me on my blog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, throw him on his blog. He's yeah. asking for it, okay? Yeah. So please do. And, yeah. and um, I've been asking you questions. Okay. So do you have any questions for me? Okay, so what strategy do you have uh, when your growth stocks are down? And, and what kind of recommendations you have uh, for the younger people who uh, basically time the markets wrongly and they are stuck in the doldrums right now. Of course, we can assume that they don't have leverage. So, so I think, uh, so it's not so stressful, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I think this is um, a difficult question to answer yeah. because everybody have a different kind of psychological mm. makeup, mm. right? Um, for, for someone who could uh, withstand a 50% drawdown mm. or 30% drawdown, but it cannot be said for another person. Okay, okay. Maybe just 10%, you cannot take it. I, th- I think that um, it's impossible to even uh, foretell beforehand right. Right, how would a person react uh, on a drawdown. Uh, it's not just whether is it a growth stock or value stock or dividend source or whatever. These kind of things can happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? yeah, happen to us and much. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that um, the only way to know is you put your money at risk, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Otherwise, it's yeah. all just very theoretical. You know, uh, I yeah. believe I can take a 50% drawdown. I'll right. stay rational. But you know, when you see your, your portfolio going down that level and you will start to feel it, okay. and different people feel at different levels. And um, some people get over it after a while. Some people can't. Okay. Right? And I, I think that this is a very good discovery right? Uh, for someone to really understand where their limit is. Okay. And that's where I think that uh, some people then will realize that, oh, actually, I should not be picking stocks. Okay. I should be buying like ETFs or even I should pass the money to an advisor or robot advisor or investment manager or whatever. Okay. As long as I can detach myself from this emotional roller coaster yeah. that I'm going to suffer. And I, I do hold that belief that most people are not suitable to uh, pick their own investments. Okay. That, that's my personal belief, right? But those who are willing to try, we must always give them the opportunity to do so. Okay. Otherwise, you never know, right? You might discover the next guy who can really manage your own portfolio, like how a lot of the other bloggers manage yeah. to do so. Okay. And um, one thing that I see that's positive is that a lot of the uh, new bloggers are coming in. And I, I remember when we first, we, we, <laughs> were, we are probably considered the pioneers of financial <laughs> yeah, blogging, yeah. right? Yeah. When, right. when we first blog, yeah. like, there's no such category yeah, of financial right. bloggers That's right. it was just yeah. bloggers yeah. <laughs> and we cover that niche and it's, yeah. I, I'm pretty happy to see that uh, um, uh, more people are coming up right. yeah, almost like every month you have new blogs coming up yeah. even in a small little island in Singapore so I think that people are more uh, are really paying attention to all these uh, invest, investment things so I, I, re- I have no solution right, okay. to really help anyone with drawdowns Right. Yeah, okay. That 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 is uh, very clear from my side. I think it's a self discovery issue. Okay. I, I totally agree with you. From a quantitative perspective, there's not much of a solution <laughs> for them. They have to bite the bullet. <laughs> yeah. But at least those who yeah. are coming for our causes, they are willing to try. Yeah, they're willing to try right. And yeah. it's a self discovery process. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a choice, uh, and, and you can only make one choice, uh, between US tech and Chinese tech, which would you choose and why? It's a, it's a damn tough question yeah. because because I'm a guy who yeah. likes to spread my eggs. Yeah, yeah. Only <laughs> one choice. Only one choice. You're putting yeah. me on a spot. Okay. Mm. Um, at this point in time, if you ask mm. me, I will put in US tech. Mm. Okay. Uh, for for a few reasons, uh, even though I would say that it's a tough choice, mm. right? But for the first is that um, in terms of really really the hardcore technology, uh, US is still ahead. Mm. Right. Uh, China is still behind although they have some successes in certain areas when even we talk about space exploration US put the first rover in Mars mm. but China follows suit pretty close yeah. um, they are not that far as most people think they are right? uh, but I still will, if you force me uh-huh. I'll put a bet on US because they're still the leader and uh, second is that like what you pointed out just now that um, China doesn't like yeah. uh, 
<laughs> a very clear winner, especially an outspoken yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they don't. <laughs> right? Like they, Jack Ma, it's totally not acceptable. Yeah, it's totally yeah. unconfusion. Yeah, yeah, it's unconfusion. Yeah, the <laughs> merchant cast is the lowest cast among exactly. the four, based if, on what I remember. If Jack yeah. Ma is in US, he'll be safe. Mm. Okay, if Elon Musk is in China, he's be doomed. He'll be in jail. He'll be doomed. Your market manipulation. <laughs> he'll be like Posey, yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, he'll be Posey, like. Okay. Yeah, we're not yeah. political commentators, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's what we think. Yeah. And uh, that's that's where I think that you know, in in business, you if you want to invest in business, you are definitely a capitalist thinking. Right. And 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 your point about your worry. Setting a floor on taxes, this yeah. is very uncapitalistic. Yeah. Okay. And US on this front is definitely better, right? In China, you cannot outshine the master. You yeah. cannot be too rich. Yeah. You cannot be too outspoken. And all the all the measures that's coming in is to really rein in this rich individual. Yeah. And the dilemma that I always have is that even though China is a communist country, it has even a much uh, further rich poor gap. Than a democratic capitalistic society. That yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. So I think true. I think China yeah. has to do something about it yeah. because otherwise they can no longer call themselves socialists. That entire yeah. structure or that principle will fall apart. So it will always be inherent in that, and that means that if I want to bet on the biggest winner, it has to come from the US, hmm. right? So if you force me to choose, I would choose the US. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well. Yeah, yeah, no more yeah I got no more questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, these no are more questions as well. I, I, yeah. I think probably yeah. we went a bit more like, I don't know, philosophical yeah. or political or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we were just like throwing each other as much as we can. Yeah, okay? yeah, and yeah. showing respect, okay, that's important, yeah. right? But if you want to really throw Chris, you can always yeah. throw his blood. Yeah. Don't throw me, okay? Don't throw me. Yeah. Uh, just one word of advice for the crypto frat boys who are uh, making a lot of noise in these financial forums. Now remember, when you fry takwitia, right? Uh, make sure your nipples don't get burned. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, whatever that means, all right? So we'll catch you later next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>